Welcome to Biocanics Health Intelligence Exchange Community, where leading practitioners in integrative health approaches will discuss how they solve the most challenging and common health issues. These regular Q&A discussions are designed to take a deep dive into case studies and integrative approaches in order to elevate the collective knowledge of both experienced and new practitioners alike. Biocanics Health Intelligence Exchange, your community for functional medicine. All right, welcome to the Health Intelligence Exchange, everyone. This week, our guest is Dr. Jack Wolfson, and we'll be digging into a cardiologist's view on carnivore and functional medicine. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're watching and listening so you never miss an episode. And for those of you joining us live today, we'll be transitioning to a live Q&A towards the end of this presentation, so feel free to start posting your questions in the comments below wherever you're watching. Dr. Jack is a board-certified cardiologist, number one Amazon best-selling author, husband and father, and the nation's number one natural heart doctor. For more than two decades, more than one million people have enjoyed the warmth, compassion, and transformational power of his natural heart health courses and events. He's the number one natural heart doctor. Dr. Wolfson, Wolfson is the founder of Natural Heart Doctor, a heart health practice and online informational website at thedoctorswolfson.com. An online resource center with natural heart information and cardiology coffee. Uh, it's great tasting all organic heart healthy coffee is a natural cardio is uh, he is a natural cardiologist called upon by doctors uh, to travel across the globe for his natural heart health treatments and advice. And he and his wife are committed to making the world a better place to live for us all. Thanks for so, so much for joining us. Let's jump right in. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You know, I don't know, I know where it kind of like that intro came from, but it's like, as you say that, like the warmth and compassion. Um, I guess I try and come across that way. I don't know how, how often I do. You know, I know you guys pretty well, and I, I think I can sometimes be warm and compassionate. But uh, uh, anyway, but I think it also stems really. I mean, like sometimes you got to hit people the he over the head with a sledgehammer. You know, you got to you got to say something that really shakes the foundation of their reality. Otherwise, you're not going to make a difference if you kind of sugarcoat things like, you know, you know, you may want to try this or try a little bit of that. Yeah, that method can work. It's not my method. The way that my wife and I really like to operate is just, hey, we're going to smack you over the head with the truth. What you want to do with it is 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 up to you. But you're not going to accuse me of not telling you that truth. So maybe for a bit of background, you know, uh, just going back to your book, you know, a lot, you know, there's obviously a lot of controversy about diet, cardiology, its impacts on heart health. How did you first become interested in the paleo slash carnivore approach to cardiology? And, you know, where did those, you know, where was the aha moment that really kind of set you up down this pathway? Yeah, that's an awesome question. You know, uh, I when uh, everybody knows uh, that medical doctors get no training in nutrition, uh, dietary approaches, lifestyle approaches, wellness approaches. That's obvious. My first introduction, though, really was when I was a cardiology fellow and I was at the American College of Cardiology meetings in the year 2000. And there was a debate between the late Robert Atkins of high fat, low carb fame versus Dean Ornish of the low fat, high carb fame. And those guys hated each other. And for 45 minutes, they were yelling and screaming at each other uh, and each one getting their point across as best they could. But I walked out of there saying, wow, Atkins makes perfect sense. So I started to read more, but listen, I was, you know, in my late twenties, early thirties, I'm a single guy living in Chicago at the time. And I, you know, I, I just, I couldn't adhere to that type of lifestyle. It, it was, it, it was something I could talk about the patients a little bit, but I could never could follow it. And then fast forward a few years later, when I would meet the young chiropractor who would quickly become my wife. Uh, I started reading books by, you know, Weston A. Price, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Neanderthin by Ray Audet, the original The Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain, PhD. And those things really resonated with me. They made a lot of sense. And I said, you know, you know what, if I'm going to change my life personally, I'm going to change patients' lives. Uh, this whole paleolithic ancestral approach makes the most amount of sense. And then since, since then, I've read countless books. But, you know, sometimes, Jeremy, it's a matter of, hey, go watch 
the TV shows. Go watch Alone, Naked and Afraid, Survivor. Those people are hunter-gatherers. The vegans who show up there, they either quit the show or they start eating animal products. Uh, and uh, I think once you look at, you know, through the lens of modern day paleo peoples, modern day paleo behaviors, looking at the anthropology, paleontology literature, looking at data from the explorers, you know, Captain Cook and Magellan and what those people said about the foods that people were eating around the world. Uh, I think it's it's pretty obvious and, and anecdotally and really in the medical literature, there's plenty of evidence to support what's common sense. Yeah. So maybe kind of, you know, I think most people are obviously familiar with the framework of LDLC as kind of the marker for atherosclerosis. You know, where do you kind of, you know, you know, if somebody's coming to you from the standard of care saying, hey, look, you know, my and I'm going to use my dad as an example because we're having this conversation now. Hey, look, my LDL, my LDLC is 134. My GP wants to put me on a statin. Where do you start? Uh, well, I start by saying this. Never take a statin drug. That's number one, two, and three. Never take a statin drug. Cardiovascular disease has an infinite number of causes. Lack of statin drugs is not one of them. Lack of PCSK9 inhibitors like Repatha is not one of those causes. The causes of heart disease are violations of eat well, live well, think well. Whoever built us, God, evolution, God created evolution, gave us cholesterol for, again, many, many, many different re reasons and purposes. Uh, cholesterol has been vilified for the benefits of the pharmaceutical companies uh, and, and those under the pharmaceutical companies' control. The uh, LDL has been vilified as the bad cholesterol, which on the surface, again, is a huge joke. Why do all animal species contain LDL? Why do all mammals, again, contain LDL and HDLs and all these different particles? They all serve a reason. So I don't really look at total cholesterol or total LDL because it, it, it's a useless measurement. To me, what if, when I look at something in the lipid particle area, I'd want to know small, dense LDLs which are kind of synonymous with the oxidized LDLs. If you have a lot of oxidative stress, oxidized LDLs, you're in trouble, but you better figure out why. And the answer, of course, is not statin drugs or any other pharmaceutical. So it's really the measurements of oxidative stress and inflammation, HSCRP, PLA2, uh, MPO, you know, I mean, you can look at interleukins, you can look at lipid peroxides, you can look at a lot of different things. Uh, and, and they're all useful and they all, you know, give great benefits. The other thing from a lipid standpoint, I think the triglycerides gives us uh, useful information in the sense that the lower the triglycerides, the better. And the people who typically follow a lower carb, more uh, animal based approach, uh, they tend to have a lot lower triglycerides. And if they don't, then we got to dig deeper and there may be some other environmental toxins or some other factors that are leading to, you know, abnormal lipids, including triglycerides. And then uh, also, of course, you know, looking at uh, LP little a, look at uh, LP parentheses, small a, uh, 15 to 20% of the population has it, genetic marker, uh, paleolithically probably had some benefits. Uh, it doesn't have much of a benefit in today's approach as far as we know. So those are a couple things to, uh, you know, to, to look at. Uh, just to circle back, you know, real quick about, about nutrition. Uh, I tell people, no matter what diet you follow, <clears throat> you know, one of my good friends is Joel Kahn, vegan cardiologist. I know, you know, jo uh, Joel, many people on this platform, you know, do. There's other, you know, vegan people, vegan cardiologists. If we can all agree on one thing, it's to make everything organic and to keep the chemicals out of our food and the pesticides and the synthetics and the, fer you know, synthetic fertilizers and toxins, keep that out of the food. Let's do that. The other comment I would make about food is that when it comes to you know food, make sure you're getting enough seafood because seafood is the healthiest food on the planet. Uh, organs are kind of like this 1A, but uh, whole seafood is, is the penultimate. And a lot of carnivore people miss that. They just go for the land animals and maybe not even the best choices there. Don't forget to eat the seafood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh Awesome. So, you know, in kind of your experience, you know, somebody kind of the, the next person kind of walks into your clinic and starts working with you. 
they have questions around heart health, maybe they came to you for elevated, you know, hypertension, everything else. What do you, you know, what are you using for a screening approach? And then what do you typically see in the response? Like if you want to walk through a case study to making carnivore slash paleo types of changes, like how do you see that kind of unfold in a pre and post perspective? Well, our whole methodology, no matter what somebody comes in with, and I tell our doctors and our health coaches and tell it to anybody who wants to listen, that no matter what someone presents with, with whatever medical label they carry, and that could be high blood pressure, could be dyslipidemia, could be coronary disease, could be cancer, could be autoimmune, could be Parkinson's or, or, or dementia. Uh, it could be sarcoidosis, amyloidosis. I mean, again, the, the medical literature uh, and uh, pathology textbooks are full of a lot of different labels. But if we always look through it of the lens of, okay, whatever they're coming in with, their complaints, how does that fit in to the method of eat well, live well, think well? So there's all this different stuff in the eat well category that we just talked about. But what about the live well component? What is their sleep patterns like and the quality of their sleep? What is their light and sunshine exposure like? Are they indoors all the time or are they spending time outdoors? The more time we spend outdoors, of course, the longer we live. How do we move? How's our physical activity levels? What are we doing for that? What are we doing as far as chiropractic care and being under the care of a chiropractor and getting adjusted for spinal hygiene, oral hygiene from a holistic dentist. But inside of that live well also is this mega category, which is the environmental toxins. To me, at the top of that is going to be water damaged buildings and structures leading to mold toxicity, leading to bacterial toxicity, leading to further down the list would be VOCs and other chemicals off-gassing from water damage. But the, the environmental toxins, radon, carbon monoxide, uh, EMF, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on in that arena. And then, of course, the think well components of it. And they're all equally as important. The eat well, the live well, the think well, they're all married in uh, together. And that's how that's how I approach every case. And the more that someone changes from time A, you know, time zero, if you will, to some point in the future, the more benefit they're going to have. And then, of course, you want to verify that with blood work and, you know, blood, urine, stool, whatever, whatever modality of testing you want to do. Uh, I'm not into CT scans, by the way. I'm very anti uh, coronary artery calcium scans and things like that. That's all radio radioactive poison that causes disease. So I never order those tests. But can we get all this non-invasive, non-radiating data at time zero, change the person, test down the road, see how they're doing, make tweaks. That's always the strategy, no matter what the condition. It's super interesting. Like, you know, obviously the eat well is a huge component of what our practitioners recommend. The live well component, love to kind of dig into that. I mean, I think you're, you know, obviously I've, you, you know you through the cell core and the eco community. Maybe talk about, you know, what, what are your thoughts related to inflammation and environmental toxicity, specifically around heart health? I think that's one of the things that we haven't heard of. We obviously are practitioners aware of mold toxicity, environmental toxicity, but I don't think they've really thought about it specifically from heart health. You could kind of connect the dots on that. Yeah, well, you know, when I spoke at uh, when I spoke at the Cellcore Eco event, which is a phenomenal event with a phenomenal company and, and phenomenal people who attend, um, you know, I put up my slide of fourteen different mechanisms of mycotoxin cardiovascular toxicity, and I've got studies to back up every single one of those claims. Fourteen different ways that mold mycotoxins from a water damaged building, your home, your car, your office, your apartment, um, uh, wherever it may, it may be. Um, food mycotoxins, which are a factor, but I don't believe they're nearly the factor that the environmental uh, uh, mold you know, is. Uh, and, and essentially it just kind of gums up the system. So I would just say that whenever you're struggling with your patients, and you're like, ah, you know, this person, they're, they're eating, you know, 95% of their diet is like spot on. 
you know, they're, you know, I, I believe them. I trust what they're telling me. I know that they're eating, you know, organic this and that, but why are their numbers still off? It's certainly possible that their dietary, you know, things can be dialed in a little bit and changes and nuances for each individual person. But I always go back to those environmental toxins. How are they gumming up the system? For example, blood pressure. Let's, uh, you know, uh, we all know magnesium is very important for blood vessel relaxation. Uh, relaxation. Uh, it's a natural calcium channel blocker, uh, anti-inflammatory, right? Hundreds of, hundreds of different of enzymatic functions for magnesium. But if magnesium can't do the job because there are other metals in the way of the interface where magnesium would bind it to its cell surface, you know, receptor and therefore be, you know, invaginated and taken into the cell to do its work. Uh, you know, if there's if, if there are metals, if there are mold mycotoxins, if there are other environmental toxins, if there are, you know, is EMF and the EMF is changing the the structure of the proteins of the of the you know, receptors for magnesium or potassium or, you know, the pumps that all these things can have subtle changes that can have significant impact. And I, I think if you kind of just think about all these different possibilities on that microscopic sub sub microscopic, you know, level, I mean, just like, you know, quantum level, uh, how, how all these changes, you know, happen, then you can see how people get sick. Another good example would be L the LDL receptor. Why do some people, they do not clear small, you know, LDL particles leading to thus oxidized small dense LDLs? Well, that is all predicated on the LDL receptor, the catcher's mitt on the liver. So if the catcher's mitt on the liver is not functioning normally, some people have genetic defects in the LDL receptor. Some people have genetic abnormalities or changes in the ApoB which is would connect to the LDL receptor. Uh, there's also the fact that something could be in that interface. Something could be blocking the attachment of the ABOB particle getting into the LDL receptor. Many different ways that the, this whole system can break down, even to the PCSK9 itself and in the formation of, of LDL receptors and the invagination or uptake and, and, and disposal of the LDL receptors, um, uh, going into the cellular garbage cans like lysosomes. I mean, I mean, and, and the interference uh, there, for example, aluminum is known to interfere with the cellular garbage can called a lysosome, and it inhibits the ability of the lysosome to break down uh, dead and un, uh, you know, no longer necessary particles. Well, if the garbage can isn't working, then the cell stops taking in the garbage. So many different factors. And that's why there's no one approach outside of eat well, live well, think well, and you got to do all those things. Awesome. And then maybe kind of digging into the, the think well component, what do you, um, how do you kind of design the think well program as a part of that, that intervention? Yeah. And the medical doctors, of course, have the worst, uh, you know, think well, as far as like, you know, I mean, I remember my psychiatry rotation, uh, two thirds of that rotation were inpatient psychiatry. And, and the first day in there, I'm in the inner city of Chicago and I walk through, you know, my little lab coat and I walk through the, the locked, you know, door to get into another door that was also locked. And now I'm in the inpatient psych ward and I walk in and there's like this naked guy. He's like running around the room, yelling and screaming. I mean, it was like, I mean, you know, you'd call for the paddy wagon if that, except for the fact that that's how they got there. I wanted to get myself out of there on a paddy wagon. Um, that, that, that was the training. And again, like, you know, what, what are the mega doses we use for people with schizophrenia? And then from there, it goes to the outpatient where there's no conversation about, why somebody may be feeling depressed. Uh, all there is is Prozac. All there is are these, narco you know, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals for these particular things. There's no discussion of cause, you know, so it's like we don't get trained in that. Uh, I try and come back now uh, after all these years and think about the components of think well. What are the most important things there? And in my methodology, it starts with, uh, self-acceptance, self-acceptance of who you are. It goes into gratitude. It gets into purpose and passion. It gets into community. Are you with like-minded people? 
um, get with like-minded people. All this stuff was all divided, you know, during the recent pandemic where, again, the communities were totally fractured. So um, that's very, very, very destructive to heart health. We know that in the medical literature, social isolation markedly increases the risk of people dying of heart disease and others, of course. Uh, spirituality, uh, I think, is, is obviously extremely important. Uh, literature tells us that the more people participate in religious activities, the more they go to houses of worship, the more they uh, pray uh, and acknowledge uh, spirituality, uh, they live longer, they live better. Lower risk of high blood pressure, for example, lower risk of heart attacks. And then safety. Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe in your home? Do you feel safe in your community? Do you feel safe in your job? Do you feel financially safe and secure? So all these things all play in together. And just getting people to address these issues. I'm not the be all end all on this. I mean, again, like you may need to work with a counselor. You may have, you know, childhood uh, traumas. Childhood trauma markedly increases the risk. Heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure, uh, you name it. Uh, so, you know, kind of thinking about your your kind of three pillared approach from, you know, think well, eat well uh, and live well. How do you structure your own uh, cardiology clinic to be able to support that? I mean, obviously, you know, I'm sure our practitioners are listening and they're like, well, that's a lot to ask for somebody who's, you know, came in the door and you're the cardiologist for them. Right. So how do you structure your business and design your programs around that? <laughs> well, let me say this. It's not easy. It's always a work in progress. Um, it also comes down really to our myself personally, um, accepting who I am personally, trying the best that I can, trying to uh, uh, hire the best people, train them effectively. But it's not easy. That's for sure. This this what we do. You know, the old medical practice, the old cardiology practice, that was easy. Hey, blood pressure is high. Here's your pills. Hey, you've got cholesterol and coronary disease. Here's your pills. You need a stress test. You need an angiogram. You need an echocardiogram. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like that stuff was, that's easy. You get into our space, it's difficult. To answer your question, I think that uh, the approach that we use, and I think is the best approach, uh, if, if you are a physician, that you do have other people on your team that are supporting you to get this message to the patients, to work with the patients. Ideally, you would have a book. Ideally, you would have good articles. Ideally, you would have things really spelled out well to people. Um, and and could this be, again, in all those different ways, is this you creating a course, you know, based on your methodology, slowly trickling this information out there to people? Uh, and, and these are all ways that we do it, but then also letting people know that, again, you're not coming into my office and I've got like, you know, oh, I've got this cream here. I've got this cream and, and all your problems, they're going to go away because you're going to take the cream, you're going to rub it on your face and rub it under your armpits. And, you know, like that doesn't exist. And therefore, you know, it's taken a lot of people. I'm 53 years old. So it's taken me 53 years to get to this position. It's going to take some time to get out of this position. Um, but uh, you know, again, I think that continuously working with these people, uh, letting them off the hook a little bit, tell them again, it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint and, and enjoy, enjoy the journey the best you can. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a, uh you know, health transformation is not an event. It's definitely a journey. So, um, and I think everybody kind of understands that it's always tricky to implement it, especially when everybody's got their own unique challenges. So maybe from a, from a tactical perspective, what are the, what are the, you know, you, you did rattle off a number of markers for inflammation, you know, HSCRP being nonspecific. What are the things that you run that you're looking for? Like, what are the tests that you're testing for to get you that information and you perhaps, you know, go into a case study if that's helpful as well, too. Yeah, you know, you know, the if, if someone has inflammation, if someone has oxidative stress, they're in trouble. And the answer is not some kind of anti-inflammatory or anti-oxidant. You know, the answer is to figure out why they are having these issues. And it always goes back to the, you know, eat well, live well, think well component. Uh, but, you know, there's a you know, patient I saw. Um, uh, actually, a, an email comes into the office and it gets forwarded on to me and the email says, my husband 
is 64 years old. He's got ischemic cardiomyopathy. He's got a defibrillator in place. He's been under the care of the doctors at Mayo Clinic and UCLA. And he also carries the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Does Dr. Wolfson know anything about sarcoidosis? And I uh, uh, emailed and you know, I got the email and uh, I actually picked up the phone and called the woman of the, of the uh, patient, her husband. And I said, listen, I'm, a, I'm not the worldwide expert in sarcoidosis, but nobody really is because it's got, you know, if you go Google it and you can see it's, you know, it's a, uh, you know, inflammatory condition uh, of unknown etiology forms these little uh, granulomas uh, typically in, in lung tissue, for example, uh, and also can affect the heart uh, and, and other organs. I said, I'm not the worldwide expert in sarcoidosis, but I would consider myself one of the worldwide experts in causation. So let's run the whole gamut. So we run the whole gamut on him. And yeah, he's got abnormal lipids. And he's, the guy's on nine pharmaceuticals, um, uh, and, uh, including immunosuppressants. And, uh, you know, we just kind of go through the whole list. Uh, you know, again, the, all these markers of abnormal lipids, inflammation, oxidative stress, high homocysteine, like so many things are out of whack. His omega-3 levels uh, are in the toilet. He's got leaky gut. He's got environmental toxins, including mold. And one of which is stachybotrys, so, which is black mold. So I get on the internet and I'm like, yeah, right in front of him, sarcoidosis uh, and mold mycotoxins. And then one study comes up from 2011 and it says, you know, uh, sarcoidosis uh, from uh, fungal exposure, uh, you know, fungal exposure in the homes of people with sarcoidosis in 2011, one article. Uh, but, you know, again, it's just a matter of, you know, setting a precedent. I mean, you know, just because no one else knows it uh, or understands it doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, so, uh, you know, in this particular case, again, we were able to identify that he was living in mold, tuned up many other things. The guy is now on one pharmaceutical from nine. And meanwhile, he's under the care of the smartest, best physicians in the world, right? UCLA, Mayo Clinic. And they never told him anything about the test that we run uh, and I know, again, you know, a lot of you and, you know, your members and all the stuff that, uh, you know, the biocanic supports, the testing of these companies. I mean, we're, we're doing critical, critical work uh, in all these you know, arenas. So I can give case studies all day long about people with atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, uh, palpitations, PVCs, ventricular tachycardia, sudden cardiac death, neurologic disorders. You know, what makes me extremely passionate about this as well is, you know, my father died of a Parkinson's-like illness at the age of 63. And that diagnosis is called progressive supranuclear palsy. And it doesn't matter if you've heard of it or not. If someone comes to you, it's just we're, we're all doctors of cause. We're all practitioners of cause. So um, I also want to give a shout out real quick to, you know, to your wife, uh, you know, Jen. And Jen, uh, certainly, you know, because you talked about how, to, how, do, how does a business kind of structure itself in order to get this information out there. And sometimes you as the practitioner uh, really have trouble uh, seeing uh, you know, the, you know, the forest through the trees or whatever kind of metaphor you want to use. So it's great to get some outside uh, support to be able to, in people you know, who've done that, like Janet, to be able to get you through, you know, this whole maze. So you, you know, so you can really help people. You know, a lot of us have all this stuff that's packed up in our brains and it needs to be unpacked in order to help people. Yeah. I, I think that's a, it's actually a great, it brings up a great question for me, which is, you have a tremendous social media reach, right? And how did you get that? How did you start to <laughs> how did you start to create recognition as being the natural heart doctor? I think every, you know, every practitioner is as passionate as you about their particular approach. You seem to have collected it. So and go ahead and say like your biggest platform and stuff. And how did you do it? Here's here's what you need to do if you want to attract a lot of people say crazy shit. Okay. That's what, that's what you do. You say crazy stuff. I, um, I have been on the platform, you know, Facebook and, and a little bit on Instagram. Uh, and a lot of people on Facebook, they know me from my CNN appearance in 2015, you know, during the measles, uh, the alleged uh, measles outbreak in Disneyland. Anybody can Google Jack Wolfson CNN and see the whole interview and all the stuff at that time. It's very interesting uh, uh, time and, and uh, time, you know, another story to tell another time. But um, 
I had some a uh, couple marketing girls working for me, and they're like, they're like, Dr. Wolfson, you got to go on TikTok. I'm like, TikTok, that's for kids. I mean, you know, my my avatar is the 62 year old, you know, guy who drives a truck, or the you know 70 year old woman in Paradise Valley, Arizona, who's you know who's a multi millionaire, blah, blah blah blah, you know, about who my avatar is, and they're like, I really think you should do that. So I, they're like, create a, a video. That's five things I would never say as a cardiologist, five things I would never say, or maybe it was never recommend, <clears throat> whatever. Um, I would never, you know, say or recommend as a cardiologist. And one of the things I, I said, uh, I would never tell people to stop drinking coffee. I would never tell people to go to uh, traditional uh, medical doctors. And I said, I would never tell people to eat oatmeal. The oatmeal comment, Jeremy, you th think was like insulting someone's mother. The blowback that I got about oatmeal. Now, there were plenty of people who supported. They're like, totally right on, man. We're paleo, we're keto, we're carnivore. Oatmeal's, you know, for, for horses, and it's not even for horses. Like, it's not even, you know, a, a mammalian food. Like, don't eat that. Um, and to, but there were a lot of haters. And of course, whatever you get a lot of haters and a lot of lovers together, you get a lot of likes. You get a lot of... Um, uh, circulation of this, promotion of this, whenever you get all this engagement and activity. So that particular video uh, now I think has been seen about 9 million times or something like that with tens of thousands of comments. But, here, but here's the thing. It's people in our age group and older who were commenting. It wasn't a bunch of 15 year old kids like my son's friends, like they didn't say, oh, no, Dr. Wolfson, you know, Noah's dad, Brody's dad, we saw you on TikTok. They weren't saying that. It's the 60, you know, two-year-old truck driver. It's the 70-year-old, you know, you know, retiree. It's the 50, you know, one-year-old guy with high blood pressure who had a heart attack. These are the people who were there. So um, in any case, social media is an interesting thing. Listen, uh, there's so many, I, I don't want to preach to everybody. You got to be doing this. You got to be doing this. You got to be doing this. You got to be doing it, you know, cause that drives us all nuts. Um, certainly the more we work on the business, the more potentially successful the business can be. But if we forget about taking care of ourselves, if we forget about eating well, living well, thinking well ourselves, we're going to suffer. So you got to get that balance. And it's really hard to get balance if you're spending, you know, hours and hours on social media. So um, maybe I guess what, what I would say about, maybe I'll give one final word about social media. And I'm not saying I'm expert mm -hmm. at this particular thing, but quality over quantity, mm -hmm. quality, because if you put out one post that was super quality, that is seen by 10 million people, it's better than having 500 posts, you know, that are seen by, you know, a thousand people. Be careful with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the, one of the things, and uh, before I transition, we have a lot of great questions. I can see them kind of stacking up in the back end. So I want to make sure we get to them. One of the, you know, if somebody came to you, let's say that, you know, card carrying uh, cardiologist from the standard of care. And, you know, I've actually had these conversations, which is, Hey, you know, you put somebody on a paleo a carnivore diet and their LDLC went from 130 to 200. How would you respond to that? Yeah. So, you know, there's, um, uh, and, and that's really uh, pretty minimum compared to what I've seen. So there is this entity called lean mass hyper responders. So the people who go extremely low carb and their total cholesterol, some of them go up into the six, seven hundreds, eight uh, hundreds. I've even uh, seen someone who's got a total cholesterol was over a thousand so these, these levels are very high. Now, these people, they tend to run lower triglycerides. 
They tend to have blood sugar control with uh, adequate you know, hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and a lot of them do not have inflammation and I'm not concerned about those particular numbers. I don't think that we have enough information to say that it's dangerous. I don't say, I don't necessarily think we have enough total information to say that it's safe. Um, but ultimately I'm not, I'm not the low carb cardiologist. I'm not the carnivore cardiologist. I'm the paleo cardiologist. So I do recommend eating carbs. I do recommend eating fruit, eating raw honey, eating vegetables, eating uh, sweet potatoes, I, I do eat uh, quinoa uh, and rice uh, on occasion. Uh, I'll have beans every, I don't know, maybe month or two, uh, personally. That's how I'll do it. But again, I'm not, you know, uh, you know super strict, uh, you know, as far as like, the, I, I, I don't, I'm not the carnivore cardiologist. I think many different things there. Number one, introduce some degree of carbs. You can cycle up and down again, so you can go extremely low carb for a while, break out of that. You know, don't always be in ketosis. I don't think that's the answer. I don't think our ancestors were either. Uh, so again, raw honey, uh, seasonal fruit, uh, some of the starchy tubers I think are okay. Don't forget the seafood. And then ultimately, how much of a factor are all of these environmental toxins? Because I've definitely seen people where they've become lean mass hyper, hyper responders, a, a, a term that was coined by a, a gentleman by the name of Dave Feldman. And there are Facebook groups, for example, that cater to, to people with this concern. And there's some very intelligent people who are in there. But what I've seen is that I've seen people with, again, no, normalish lipids, and then they go super high when they go to this lean mass where they become, you know, they drop the weight, they're eating extremely low carb and their lipids, you know, shoot up and lipids, you know, shooting up probably a multitude of factors. One of which is that it's just, it, it's an, it's, it's a form of energy that therefore is taken up by their you know, cells and utilized, you know, for fuel, which we all need. But sometimes by cleaning out the system and detoxifying uh, a lot of the lipids start to come down. They're not going to normalize. They're not going to you know, normalize. They're not going to get down to where they were before this. Uh, but it, the other suggestion I have for those people is, okay, well, let's try, let's experiment on you, add some of the carbs back in and see how the numbers look. Because I think ultimately that if all your numbers look good, then you're on the right plan for you. So it really is about checking the numbers and then making adjustments. But to summarize, you know, to sum it all up, I'm not overly concerned about the the lipid particles in and of themselves. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I uh, actually met with Dave Feldman at the uh, Metabolic Health Summit recently, and I'll be speaking at their Citizen Science event uh, with uh, with Nick Norbitz, who did the Oreo cookie diet, uh, which was a super interesting case study. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with that, but that was kind of over social media. So, um, yeah, I, um, I'm, I, mean, I didn't see that, but again, like I've, I've, you know, I, you know, is there like a chocolate chip cookie diet and an ice cream diet? I mean, we can come up with anything. Yeah. He um, showed, he actually did an experiment on himself where he gave himself, I think 16 Oreo cookies a day and dropped his LDL by 77% and then put himself, what did a washout and then went back up to his high high LDL and then put himself on a statin and only reduced his LDL by 17%. It's pretty, it's a pretty interesting case study and it's IRB, uh, but it definitely made the round. So it kind of, you know, ties in with your thinking as well. Well, I mean, what, what I would tell people too, when it comes to oatmeal, I'm like, why eat the oatmeal? Just, I mean, if you want, you know, fiber and you want to bind up, you know, lipids and poop it out the other side, just eat the box. Yeah. <laughs> it's also zero carb. Um, <laughs> well, listen, we've got a ton of great questions. So I would like to open this up to the, to the broader community. Uh, if you're watching live, definitely post those questions. We'll try to get to them. Uh, I know our team has been collecting a bunch. So the first question came from Dr. Anna Ortiz from LinkedIn asking, what are your thoughts between the so-called oral dentistry, specifically root canal treatments and cardiac symptoms? You briefly mentioned oral microbiome health, but love to hear your thoughts on that overall. Yeah, me personally, uh, I am anti-root canal. Uh, I can't say that there's a lot of data 
uh, that that uh, supports. I mean, clearly, clearly, there's a lot of data about pulpitis or infect, infected teeth. There's a lot of data about periodontal disease as it relates to cardiovascular health and more. Like that's very clear. So, so dental infections are bad. And if dental infections are bad, what is a root canal? A root canal kills the root, which is the nerve artery and uh, you know vein to the tooth, and then they fill the tooth with uh, you know gutta or some kind of other material but and they and they attempt to clean it out the best they can but they can never be totally successful with that you can never it's a dead object in your body it's a dead organ in your body which is the tooth it's got to be removed uh, it's a big problem what do you do after it's removed do you put an implant in or not uh, personally at this point unless it's one of the front facing teeth and it's aesthetic then I do not recommend an implant. Uh, you, know, it, it, uh, you know, if it's in the back of the mouth, I don't recommend uh, an implant, but that's how I approach, uh, approach, you know, that you can do ozone uh, in the infected areas and stuff like that. You know, again, dental, and it, it's about, sometimes it's about speaking to our children and saying, hey, got to take care of your teeth. You don't want to mess those up. Yeah. And maybe just kind of as a follow on, just my own curiosity. Somebody has those amalgam fillings that they had when they were kids in the 1980s that everybody did. What's your recommendation? I definitely have them removed. Period. Full stop. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, next question. So kind of thinking about more of a paleo, you know, high protein, high fat type of dietary approach. Are there any specific risks associated with this approach that you're looking for? Uh, no, I don't think there's any risk whatsoever. I mean, our ancestors ate a certain way, lived a certain way, thought a certain way, and that's that, that's how we're built. I, I don't make the rules. It's just mother nature. We were hunter gatherers. We ate plenty of meat, plenty of seafood. Everything was organic, nuts, seeds, eggs, avocados, coconuts. Uh, raw dairy is something I give a little leeway to. Um, I, I do believe there are some medicinal benefits to raw dairy. It's not paleo food. Our ancestors did not have, uh, have it after we were weaned from our mother's breast. So um, I, I, don't, I don't see anyone who's going to benefit from another diet from there. Now, you could do various cleanses and challenges and things like that. You can do a you know, raw vegan cleanse if you want. You can do a, a carnivore cleanse, a seafood cleanse, like you mentioned before, the Oreo cookie cleanse. Um which I would never eat the Oreo cookie, but what if you did like a uh, Newman's own organic, uh, personally I'm gluten-free, but it's like, if I was gonna do the Oreo cookie challenge, I would definitely do it with uh, Newman's own. I would do it organic. I'm not challenging my body with, uh, with pesticides and uh, artificial flavors. Yeah. Um, the next question, just in the context of kind of the functional medicine testing, how do you assess the overall health of a patient? And then what are you tracking and looking for as kind of a follow on test? And go ahead and name like the specific tests that you use just for. Yeah, I, I, I mostly use uh, vibrant uh, products. I do use some uh, Genova. So we do what's called uh, typically it, it's, it's a battery of six tests uh, on everybody. So we do, uh, you know, Vibrant America, which is the advanced cardiovascular analysis with all the markers on there, a lot of which we've talked about. We do the micronutrient panel, intracellular vitamins and minerals. I find that very useful, including omega-3 levels, CoQ10 levels, glutathione levels. We do the uh, wheat zoomer, which is their test for leaky gut. Uh, and gluten and wheat sensitivity. Uh, I find that very useful. And then we do something triple toxins, so metals, molds, and the other environmental toxins. Uh, uh, gut analysis can be helpful. Uh, it's interesting. I don't, but I tend not to find it necessarily overall help uh, helpful. Although all disease uh, definitely starts in the gut. Uh, you know that's for sure. Uh, but the stool analysis, I think it's um, again, it's interesting. I just don't really. You know, think, th think it's overly impactful, you know, bang for the buck. Uh, the other thing is that we always do the, what's called the number eight Swiffer test from a company called Envirobiomics uh, or similar. You got to test someone's home from mold, my, uh, from mold and bacteria from water damage. Mold, whatever your symptoms are, whatever your patient's symptoms are, please consider mold. For years, people have talked about Lyme. The Lyme diagnosis never sat well with me. I trained in the Midwest. I came from the Midwest. I saw cases of acute Lyme. 20 year old kid is camping up in the woods, comes in lightheaded, heart rate's 20. We put a temporary pacemaker in him. Everybody gets all nervous. 
give him antibiotics. He's tested positive for Lyme, and then he goes home a week later and he's fine. That's acute Lyme carditis. Chronic Lyme never sat well. Two years of antibiotics with a uh, IV port, never liked it. Uh, to me, mo uh, what they call Lyme is living in water damage, in poor indoor air quality, uh, mold and or bacterial exposure. What they call Lyme, uh, again, Lyme in and of itself, our bodies are perfect unless you destroy the immune system. So if we are living in water damage and our immune we are immunosuppressed, then we can't clear Lyme or other co-infections. Uh, this opinion can be controversial, but in case, you know, amongst holistic practitioners who base their entire career on Lyme, but you know what, uh, Jeremy, I don't really care what uh, what other people think of me. That's that's their business, not mine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to kind of see the evolution, uh, but I think, you know, like anything, it's just more knowledge, more understanding, more more opportunities for healing. One of the, you know, not a question, but one of the things we didn't touch on is kind of the supplementation approach. So we talked about your diagnostic, your evaluation, your lifestyle, uh, your mindfulness approach. What do you think, you know, what's your approach on supplementation? Yeah. That, and that's interesting too, because that's certainly morphed, you know, over time. And yeah, you're right. I mean, listen, everybody, we're all on a journey here and stuff like that, but my, obviously you can see I'm very passionate about the indoor air quality, the mold, you know, damage, water damage, et cetera. Um, but that being said, you know, regarding supplements, where we really stand right now is that we're really leaning towards food based supplementation. So organ based supplements, we sell products that are uh, grass fed, grass finished bison. Uh, there's nothing more healthy and majestic uh, than bison. Uh, the products that I carry at Natural Heart Doctor, my wife's company, Wild Mamas, we do uh, a field harvested, unvaccinated bison in a capsule. In the case of my product, Kickstart My Heart, Liver uh, liver Heart is mine. She's got seven different uh, organs in hers uh, and that her product's called Mother of All Prenatals. Um, and then I've got a product called The Whole Fish, which is the entire sardine in a capsule. I'm, eat seafood, eat organs, do it. But if you wanna take good food in a capsule, uh, that's the way that is great for traveling and stuff like that. The other thing that I would say is that there is a great opportunity for uh, for binders. Uh, we're really loving the fulvic acid, humic acid type products of which uh, there are many, um, uh, you know, to use. Uh, Pure Black is a really good Sheila Jeet company, comes in little glass containers. Uh, I love, love, love Carolyn Allen over at uh, Beam Minerals, right? They were with us over at um, uh, the American Academy of Anti-Aging, their longevity event. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, Cellcor has, has a fantastic suite of products. And I think, you know, again, it's about kind of giving your body all the stuff it needs, uh, but then these additional detox strategies. Uh, that being said, I mean, there are other products that we can use, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, New Zealand grass-fed whey protein. We have a product called Daily Defense, phase one, phase two, liver detoxifiers, phase three binders. Should people be on digestive enzymes sometimes, probiotics, you know, sometimes, uh, berberine is another superstar in the cardiovascular realm. Uh, but, uh, you know, ultimately, I think, th you know, that's really our kind of whole, you know, this whole long method, eat well, live well, think well, test, don't guess, evidence-based supplements, and then the, the component of biohacking strategies, of which, again, there are, you know, you, again, you and I were just the A4M and everybody there, it's all biohackers. You know, I spoke at Dave Asprey's event last year, biohacking, you know, red light therapy, sauna therapy, IV therapy, methylene blue therapy, you know, brain tap, you know, uh, bagel stimulators. There's, there's a million things that people could do. But just to remember that supplements supplement the healthy lifestyle and biohacking is at the end of the natural journey, not at the beginning, if you want to be successful. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a great point. Maybe just kind of digging in to uh, just on the organ supplementation side. So obviously, you know, desiccated organs has come into some visibility and definitely not in the mainstream, but why, why bison, why not beef, you know, um, with your particular supplement? Yeah, most certainly. So, I mean, uh, uh, by beef, Typically, uh, not typically, I think universally, they're coming, uh, most products are coming from uh, Australia, New Zealand. These are old cows that have been milked to death and then they are sacrificed and they're put into a capsule. Uh, New Zealand, from what I, I've never been there, but from what I understand, it's not quite the utopia that everybody makes it out to be vaccinated animals 
in some cases treated inhumanely. Uh, and then the kill process of most of these animals is very stressful. Now you get the stress uh, hormones, uh, neurotransmitters potentially into the meat. So many different problems there. The bison is a free range animal. It's an American animal, free range animal, extremely hardy. They're original, they're not hybrids. Cows of today are not the original aurochs that were running around 10,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago. They're a modified animal. Bison are not. Bison are majestic. The bison runs into the storm. The bison runs into the storm. It is truly a free range animal. And then the ones that we get, of course, the other ones, you know, I mean, so the, the, the cow products, the cattle products, they're gonna be vaccinated. Um, and we prefer to have our, our meat unvaccinated and that's what we choose. So that's inside of ours, you know, and as far as like the actual breakdown of fats versus proteins and vitamins and minerals, there, there, there's some things that are circulating around on the internet. I think data uh, proving one way or another is actually pretty scant. I just use the common sense approach. Go look at a typical cow and go look at a bison and see what you would rather eat. Don't get me wrong. Thank you, uh, God. Thank you for the bison. Thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bison, for for uh, uh, sacrifice. You know, be, you know, for your sacrifice uh, for my uh, health. Now, it's a, again, I, I don't make up the rules. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, three point five years of human uh, evolution. Yeah, awesome. And I'm gonna with this last question before we kind of wrap this up. I wanted to kind of combine a couple of questions. So I'm gonna try to take the spirit of a few. You know, when some when you they come to you and then maybe, you know, they're concerned about kind of the paleo high fat carnivore approach, right? They're literally my mom uh, who questions my high protein diet. How do you have that conversation with them to get them over the line to being OK with letting go of that, what they've been taught about the food pyramid for years? Like, how, are there particular approaches or you know, is there a way that you get them over the line to get them feel comfortable adapting a paleo or carnivore approach? Yeah, I think, you know, it can, again, it just goes back to the adage, right? You can lead to the horse to the water. You can't make them drink. All we can do is give people the information and then it's up to them what they want to do about it. One-on-one uh, -on -one conversations can be difficult for a lot of different reasons. You know, it's like, a, you know, during one-on-one, -on -one, we've all got like our, 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 our battleground like set up. So, Provide information. Hey, would you be willing? To, you know, Mom, I would. I, I love you. I care about you. Uh, will you? Uh, will you watch? Um, uh, you know, watch this video. Will you watch this TV show alone? Like, I mean, like, look what they're doing there. Uh, or, or listen to this doctor. Or watch this TV show, Naked and Afraid. Or read this book called Neanderthal by Ray Audet, The Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain. Read Weston A. Price, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. But please don't just sit there and listen to your doctor who has no training on prevention. All your doctor is, is a pharmaceutical pusher. They're a drug pusher controlled by drug companies. So here's the information. Now it's, now it's in your hands. Awesome. Well, this has been a great discussion and I want to thank everybody who joined us today. If you're watching this as a replay, you can still post your questions uh, and post them in the comments below. We'll make sure we'll get Dr. Jack to answer them. Um, uh, so first of all, let's hear about you and where they can learn more about both the natural heart doctor, but also the products that you mentioned here at the end. Yeah. So, you know, uh, naturalheartdoctor.com all spelled out is my website. Uh, you can go check that out and you'll see, you know, blogs and, and various things there and you stay in touch there. We're all over social media at the places we talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much the uh, the best way to, you know, to go about it. If you've got, uh, you know, I do st still see patients. Uh, I've been doing virtual consulting since 2012. Uh, if I could help in any way regarding your business, uh, uh, I'd be more than happy to, you know, lend my two cents or guide you in the right direction about anything. Uh, we also, you know, Jeremy, you know, I talked about this. We've got 110 acres. We're building a community down in the mountains of Costa Rica, health retreat center, but mostly community, families, like-minded people, people who understand what's going on around the world and want a safe place to live 
uh, and potentially during uh, the next phase of their plan, we will have a safe uh, harbor as best as possible, you know, down there in Costa Rica. So feel free to reach out uh, regarding that. Awesome. Well, hopefully my internet is, sorry. Sorry, my internet just went wonky at the very end. Um, but uh, thank you again, Dr. Wolfson. Hopefully this is coming through. Um, really appreciate you joining us. Love everything that you do. And um, please join us next week for best practices and our Coffee Circle live stream. And again, in two weeks for our next guest, who I believe is Karan Krishnan and his new entities that he's, uh, you know, bringing into the functional health industry. All right. Thanks, everybody.